welcome to HBM's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, January 24th, 2024. <clears throat> we have quite a few things to talk about, so let's get started. Carl Shakur <clears throat> has written about the hideous hodag, history of a hoax. Back in the pioneering days of North America, when European settlers were attempting to tame the vast wildernesses full of unfamiliar creatures in what to them was the new and very strange, even somewhat frightening continent of North America, rural workers such as lumberjacks and loggers would often spend appreciable periods of time away from their families and homesteads. Consequently, for company to keep safe, they would bond together by gathering around fires in their campsites at night, deep within the dark forbidding forests, and while away the hours by telling tall tales to amuse and play scare each other, seeing who could spin the most outlandish, spine-chilling yarns full of daring feats and terrifying monsters, the latter often inspired by sightings and sounds of what to them were still very mysterious, potentially dangerous native creatures inhabiting this immense new world. Now here is a medallion de depicting the hodag. This individual, Eugene Shepard, being pulled in a cart Pulled by a moose. Here is an illustration of the alleged hodag. Here is P.T. Barnum, the famous circus individual. Artistic representation of the hodag. And apparently, I guess these dinosaurs were kind of the inspiration for the hodag. This is a reconstruction of the hodag based directly upon the specimen in Shepard's 1893 hodag photograph. Now, here's the alleged hodag, but it turned out to be something completely made up. Now, this was a made-up creature. But you, you see this artwork of some creature, traditional Native American pictograph, an image of a water panther. These may have been the inspirations for the hodag. Very interesting, but you know, it was all a hoax, obviously. Every single bit of it was a hoax. So we have to be careful what we believe from the past. Because it could have turned out to be just a hoax. Or a newspaper story, which got out of hand, basically. Is there a problem with skepticism? One of my best friends is a skeptic, and yet for years he has been trying to convince me not to use the S-word. You see, every time he talks to someone about the activities of our local group, New York City Skeptics tries to promote the Skeptical Inquirer, or our former podcast, Rationally Speaking, he runs to the same problem. People are immediately turned off by a term they interpret as characterizing a persistent doubter, Someone who scoffs at every new notion, a pessimist, or a prophet of doom. And who wants to be that? Of course, we know better. Readers of this magazine likely are aware that the word skeptic comes from the ancient Greek skeptikos, meaning inquiring, reflective. Let's skip over the etymologically annoying fact that skeptical inquirer literally and rather redundantly means inquirer, inquirer. Skeptics, therefore, ideally are curious and open-minded people 
who assess beliefs based on arguments and evidence, who inquire into things, and who are willing to change their positions if the facts on the ground demand it. Who wouldn't want to be that? And the article just goes into basic descriptions of skepticism. Now, you have to be careful, if you are a skeptic, not to get into cynicism. To be cynical of the world around you. Some skeptics, unfortunately, do tend to become cynical. Not saying all of them, but some of them do. Anyway, I'll include the link to this below so you guys can read for yourselves. And, oh bother, here we go again. Study finds Bigfoot signs correlate with black bear populations. The big conclusion, if Bigfoot is there, it could be a bear. The idea that North America is home to a completely unknown primate species just doesn't seem to go away. Years after everyone started walking around with high-quality cameras in their phones, there still haven't been any clear images of a Bigfoot. Uh, what was about the Patterson-Gimlin film? It's pretty clear. It was taken with a 60 millimeter camera. But that doesn't stop the steady flow of purported sightings. Now someone named Flo Foxen, now that person again, has followed up on an earlier analysis to check for factors that could influence the frequency of Bigfoot sightings throughout North America. The results suggest that there is a strong correlation between sightings and the local black bear population. For every 1,000 bears, the frequency of Bigfoot sightings goes up by about 4%. It's easy to see how black bears and Bigfoot can be mistaken for each other. Despite their name, the bears come in a wide range of colors, from a golden brown through to a deep reddish one, as well as their namesake, Black. They're also large animals that will frequently stand on their hind legs to get a better view of their surroundings. They also frequent the forested areas that are supposedly Bigfoot's favorite terrain. Fox and even quotes the reported Bigfoot sightings as saying, as that pictures were obtained, but one of the pictures looks like a bear. <sighs> so once again, this Flo Foxen is once again saying, Well, there's no Bigfoot, it's just bears. It's ridiculous. Does this Flo Foxen think that people, that especially hunters, can't tell the difference between a Bigfoot and a bear. John Bennenagle had an excellent field guide type drawing in his books, which showed the difference between bears and Sasquatch. Bears have the big ears, the long snout, the tapering shoulders. And they don't walk very far on their hind legs. Sasquatch can walk very well on their hind legs. And they don't have the big ear. They don't have the long snout. I suppose under the right conditions one might mistake a bear for a Sasquatch. But they have to be, it would have to be pretty dark. They'd have to, perhaps if they have Bigfoot on the brain, maybe they could say that the bear is a Sasquatch. But that's not true in all cases. And I wish the media would stop giving would stop giving press to people like this, like Flo Foxen. What am I saying? 
the media is always going to give press to people like Flo Fox and because to them, there's no Sasquatch. Oh, bother. Uh, never mind. Video. Webcam watcher captures first virtual Nessie sighting of 2024. Guessing this is supposed to be Nessie right here. And that was it. Interesting. A persistent Loch Ness webcam watcher recently captured the first virtual monster sighting of 2024 by way of a weird moment where an unusual shape crosses the water of the famed Scottish site. <coughs> the peculiar scene was reportedly spotted this past Tuesday morning by diligent live stream viewer Eowyn O. Failed again of Ireland. As seen in the video above, shortly before dawn that day, the peaceful waters of Loch Ness were suddenly pierced by a 10-foot-long anomaly that surfaced and then moved in the northern direction. The motion of the suspected creature is of particular interest to Ophel again, who argues that it could be a clue as to how the monster goes about its day. Hmm. I mean, could that be Nessie? I mean, it's a good question, but it could just as easily be something else. I think just as skeptics need to be careful of cynicism, that cryptid researchers need to be careful that they don't immediately say everything is one thing when it turns out to be another. I mean, I'm not, I'm not bashing Mr. O. Failed again. You know, he's, he's very diligent in what he's doing. Keeping an eye on the camera, the webcam that's focused on Loch Ness. I think that's pretty terrific what he's doing. I think he should be careful he doesn't have Nessie on the brain. So, I'm just saying, be careful that you don't mistake one thing for another. Just be careful, guys. Replication and Skeptical Investigation. And here's a frame from the Patterson-Gimlin film. Now, the part that interested me was right here. Bigfoot's famous film. I've heard some version of this question dozens of times during my career as a monster investigator. Though I've investigated the best photographic evidence for several mysterious creatures, most prominently the 1977 photograph of the Champ Lake monster, as seen in the articles Joe Nickel and I wrote in the August, July slash August 2003 issue of Skeptical Inquirer in our book Lake Monster Mysteries, 
I hadn't done an in-depth investigation into the famous 1967 footage taken in Bluff Creek, California by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimmon, PG. The film was said to show a female Bigfoot, dubbed Patty, walking across a riverbed. Well, first of all, it's not a riverbed, it was a creek bed. Let's try and get that little detail correct there, Ben. This is from Ben Radford. The film has been the subject of controversy and debate for half a century and is routinely cited as the gold standard for Bigfoot footage, even some 50, he says 55 years. Okay, that's the second mistake. It's been 56 years, which is deeply suspicious given the ubiquity of high-quality smartphone cameras since then. Though the footage is blurry, one thing is clear. It's either a hoax or a Bigfoot. Skeptics have offered damning analysis, analyses, both the Paris and the murky circumstances under which the film was created and developed. See, for example, Greg Long's The Making of Bigfoot and Daniel Locks and Don Donald Prothero's Abominable Science. Bigfoot believers offer a variety of responses, many of which wrongly place the burden of proof on skeptics, such as, if it's a guy in a suit, where is the suit? And if it's fake, why can't anyone recreate the film using the materials available in 1967? The alleged failure of the film to be recreated by researchers has long been a popular talking point among Bigfoot believers. A few examples will suffice. A fellow named Scott Wrench, in replying to a Skeptoid YouTube video about the PG film, wrote in January 2022 that a real skeptic would prove the film was a hoax by recreating the film using techniques and materials used to create the alleged hoax footage. The BBC did this already and failed miserably. The same BBC show was also directed to me by noted cryptozoologist Ken Gerhardt and others. <clears throat> now, what Ben Radford claims in this article is that the movement of the subject of the Patterson Gimlin film was recreated by the BBC, but they weren't exactly trying to replicate the Patterson Gimlin film. Well, if that's true, then why do the narrators say Roger and Bob? The the narrators went to Bluff, or the the the, the, the production company went to Bluff Creek and attempted to recreate the Patterson Gimlin film. They claimed that they recreated it exactly. No, they did not. They didn't even bother to use the right guy in the costume. Now, Radford argues that no, they weren't trying to use... They weren't trying to use the real costume or the alleged real costume. It was for a test shoot, I guess. See, the show at no point claims to recreate the Patterson Gimlin film itself. Instead, it's an attempt at recreating the action depicted in the film, which is a very different matter. Accident and crime reconstruction analysis recreate actions all the time, using anything from toy cars to computer animation. It's a very straightforward process that does not require replicating all the relevant conditions at play when an event occurred. Even when an accident or a crime is recorded on video, the investigators need not recreate the video itself, just the actions of people and objects seen in the video. The goal of the X Creatures show was to determine how plausible Patterson and Gimlin's claims are using only two criteria. The reported distance and the original camera and lens. That's it. The show makes this crystal clear. The most important revelation is how close Roger and Bob were to the creature. They were right on top of it, which makes the behavior seem, seem even less natural. It walked away, utterly unconcerned. At this distance, with this lens, you're certain to get the creature in the frame unless you artificially wobble the camera. There was no attempt at replicating the original film, nor for that matter was there any attempt at duplicating the costume, which would be necessary for recreating the film. We completely see that the hair color is wrong, the hair length is wrong, the size is wrong, 
The musculature is wrong, and the feet they use looks nothing like what could possibly have made the tracks allegedly found at the site. The angle of the creature is wrong, the terrain is wrong, and so on. Hmm. I mean, th that's interesting. That's interesting because I thought that that's what they were trying to do. I thought that they were trying to replicate the Patterson Gimlin film. Maybe I've been wrong all this time. I mean, I would, I would be glad to admit when I'm wrong. I'd be glad to to listen to Mr. Radford's explanation. <clears throat> the whole point, I guess, Mr. Radford is trying to make here is replication is important to undertake. And according to Mr. Radford, not too many individuals have actually successfully recreated the Patterson Gimlin film. But it's it's not on the skeptics who do it, apparently. It's on the proponents who say it is the real deal. In other words, it's incumbent upon the claimants to come up with the proof, not on the skeptics. Interesting. Ten most Googled monsters in the U.S. The skunk ape? Now this illustration gives it little ears up on top of the head. Are they trying to implicate this just a bear? Champy, New York, Champ, brother, Jersey Devil, Jackalope, Mothman, Thunderbird, Chupacabra, Wendigo, number three, Bigfoot, number two, Skinwalkers, number one. Hmm. Honorable mentions the Menahuni from Hawaii, Lalakas from Connecticut, Takuhei from South Dakota, Bear Lake Monster in Utah, Dark Watchers from California. Interesting. So, Bigfoot is number two <clears throat> behind Skinwalkers. And per year, they, they have those statistics listed. Per, per year, there's 325,000 searches for the skunk ape. 486,000 for Champy, 728,000 for the Jersey Devil, 1.6 million for the Jackalope, also 1.6 million for Mothman, 1.9 million for Thunderbirds, 2.9 million for Chupacabra, 3.6 million for Wendigo, 4 million for Bigfoot, and 6 million for Skinwalkers. So those are the basic statistics on the most Googled monsters in America. Legendary Argentine lake monster to be celebrated with new walking tour. 
A legendary Argentine light monster <clears throat> will soon have its moment in the sun thanks to a new walking tour which celebrates the creature that spawned worldwide headlines over a century ago and continues to captivate people to this day. Previously a part of indigenous folklore, the mysterious beast said to reside in Nahuel Huapi Lake reportedly entered the proverbial cryptozoology canon back in 1922 by way of a story in a Canadian newspaper. In the article, a man named George Garrett recounted visiting the site around a decade earlier and seeing a plesiosaur-like creature emerge from the water. His tale was picked up by media outlets around the world, and the second witness subsequently came forward with a contemporaneous sighting of what seemed to be the same animal. The two separate accounts of a sizable mystery creature, dubbed Nahuelito, lurking in the lake, sparked something of a frenzy, and an expedition was soon launched to look for the oddity. While the search failed to find any trace of the aquatic beast, a veritable monster was born out of the excitement, and has since come to be regarded as Argentina's version of Nessie, to the point that its home is now dubbed La Laguna del Plesiosaurio, or Laguna del Plesiosaur. Much like its cousin from Scotland, Nehumilito has drawn visitors from around the world, inspired a variety of commercial ventures, and may have even been filmed on a few occasions by astounded observers. Well, it's an interesting tourist attraction, that's for sure. And there's no guarantee that tourists will actually see the creature. But they'll at least get to take in the views of a beautiful place. I suppose that's what it's all about. And finally, proving that animals do not read or respect borders, and don't have to, Incredibly rare Tibetan brown bear spotted in India for the first time ever. Wildlife officials in India could not believe their eyes after a camera trap captured images of an incredibly rare Tibetan brown bear that had ventured into the country. Revealing the remarkable photos in a press release, the Forest and Environmental Department for the state of Sikkim, which is situated in the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains, all the historic pictures, the groundbreaking revelation as they constitute the first ever confirmed record of the elusive creature in India. Rarely seen in the wild, let alone photograph, they indicated that this specific species of bear seen in the images is believed to be responsible for the folklore of the Yeti in the area. Oh, here we go. Once again, bears being claimed as the source for the Yeti. Now, I'm wondering how long has it actually been since there's been a signing of the Yeti? Because I know Peter Byrne had made the claim that it was entirely possible that the Yeti had died out. So, but then is, I mean, there may be, like I said, in some cases, it is entirely possible that a bear could be mistaken for an upright walking primate. In some cases, yes. Not in all cases, though. At least that's the way I look at it. And that's going to do it for this week. I want to thank you very much for tuning in. You guys are the heart of the show. I always say that, but I always mean it. And I'll continue to do this as long as you guys want me to. And that's going to be for a long time, I'm sure. And hey, until next week, y'all be good or be good at it. This makes me on Crypto Horn.